Okay, so coming up next, we have from our QUT folk, Dr. Bryony Wainman and Dr. David Pyle. Um, Bryony's a learning designer and David's a research fellow, both from QUT, and they're going to be looking at the virtual repository for online prax. So Bryony and David, are you here? I am. I'm not sure about Davo. Davo, you're here. around? I'm here. I'm <laughs> here. Hey, mate. How are you doing? Yo. <laughs> okay, so you guys ready to go? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Uh, can I can take control of you. You can. If you hit the little square with the, the arrow pointing up, you can share your screen from there. Okay, cool. Um, hopefully this will work. Um, can everybody see? Yes. All right. that. Hopefully. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bryony and I'm a learning designer from QUT and I'm presenting today with my mate Davo. Davo, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, I'm a research fellow at Creative Industries and I'm looking at the application of photogrammetry in the museum sector mostly. Very cool and we are super excited to be here and we're listening to all the amazing things that people are doing with XR across the sector and I think it's a really exciting time to be a learning designer so I'm thrilled to be here with you today. And Davo and I have been working on this idea for a virtual gallery. So similar to what you can see here, um, and it's really to kind of replicate the student laboratory practicums that um, students do in like things like earth, earth science, particularly at the moment. But we are looking at something that we can use as a template for other disciplines as well to um, to host online practicum. It's really early days and uh, we're still working on a proof of concept but we thought we'd come along and talk to you about what we've been doing and maybe get some ideas from you um, and I was really excited to see uh, to listen to the work that David and um, Bill were talking about yesterday as there seems to be a lot of parallels between uh, what we're doing which probably means Davo that we're on the right track which is good news <laughs> so um, there's a lot of virtual galleries around at the moment but most of them tend to use like 360 videos, meaning it's a really passive experience. Um, and that wasn't what we wanted. We wanted a space where students could actually reach in and manipulate, what's my mouse, manipulate these um, artifacts. So, you know, have a really good look at them, play with them. Oops, lost one. Um, and kind of just really look into the detail of these, uh, of these artifacts. So, these are the type of things that they would traditionally be looking at in a laboratory practicum. Stones, um, fossils, these, these are, uh, this is one of our coral fossils that we've got on here and there's a um, skull there as well that you can have a look at. So the problem with um, traditional lab prax is that students only have limited time to access a limited number of artifacts and those artifacts can actually be very delicate or very rare. So we wanted to give students unlimited access to the fossils so that they could do better in their very high stakes assessment. So we wanted to replicate the same kind of collaborative, active learning experience that students get in lab prax, but in an online environment. So we really needed to create an environment where students could um, engage in activities with each other to, um, to build social presence. Um, as a precursor for, you know, the more cognitively challenging aspects of their prac. We wanted them to be able to talk to each other and um, handle the artifacts, passing them between each other, looking for features that, that might give them clues about uh, the history of the fossil and let them get really close. So uh, being able to really magnify the, um, the fossil to have a really good look at all the features. <laughs> so, um, Plus, we needed a solution that was device agnostic. So we really had to find um, somewhere to house the models that would allow students to study them collaboratively in an environment that suited them. So um, we looked, we started looking at photogrammetry. Um, so Davo manages an awesome photogrammetry studio at QUT. And so that's how we kind of started working together on this. And photogrammetry gives us the, the opportunity to fabricate 3D models of these artifacts. 
and allow students to access them safely and independently. So um, maybe Devo, do you want to talk through the photogrammetry workflow now? Uh, okay, okay, so basically photogrammetry is reverse engineering um, photographs which flatten the 3D world. Um, and so if you take lots and lots of photographs from different angles of your object or an environment, then using a, a range of algorithms, the one that we use typically is called structure from motion. And what that does is enable you to reconstruct um, a 3D model from a bunch of photographs. The process is somewhat tedious because it involves taking lots of photographs. Um, and the better quality your photographs are, the better result you'll get when you create your 3D model. Um, but it can be done very inexpensively just using an iPhone if you've got the patience, or alternatively, you can also set up um, far more involved systems that enable, um, enable you to do things faster or better. So the rig that's behind me here um, has 80 DSLRs mounted permanently on a frame and it's designed to capture human beings. And so the problem with human beings is that they um, they move. So you need to capture them instantaneously. And this is the same technology that gets used in um, Hollywood movies for all, you know, to create Marvel digital doubles and the Marvel characters and things like that. Um, in Hollywood, the rig behind me would have about 300 cameras on it. Um, this is more of a research and a teaching system, and it's only got 80. Nevertheless, the results are still pretty good. And so we, we as well as the um, animation filmmaking screen pipeline, what we wanted to do was also see whether or not this technology had applications in other sectors like um, cultural heritage, for example. And so we did a pilot um, scan with the Museum of Brisbane, who had been gifted the uh, some, a whole bunch of garments from the Eastern Pearson collection. And what we wanted to do was see whether or not this rig was suitable for doing a complex fashion garment. And um, it was a complete disaster. Um, and university tests have proven that um, this style of rig is absolutely does not have enough cameras to do a complex fashion garment because of all the interesting recursive folds and things that you will do with that kind of garment. So we built a different kind of rig, which was um, mounted on a dolly with eight cameras on it. And by moving that camera at very small increments around the garment, um, we're able to turn our eight cameras into hundreds and hundreds, you know, a thousand cameras if we if our steps are small enough. And that was very, very successful. And um, uh, the results that we get out of that technique are um, quite impressive. Uh, and the difference between the garment and a person is that a garment doesn't move. And so um, you would think that you could put the garment on a turntable and instead of having to move the cameras around the object, you could just rotate the um, the object. And that's a technique that is used quite a lot in photogrammetry, but you have to have an object that is um, more solid, like the coral that um, we've been speaking about earlier, um, and it's completely um, inert, whereas a um, a garment will move in the breeze as you rotate it on a turntable. So you need a different kind of rig for doing pretty much a whole range of different objects. So small things like the coral, which is only about 45, 50 millimetres across, um, you cross over and you cross into an area where the depth of field you have in your photography is so shallow that you have to enter into an area called focus stacking. And so that's where you take multiple images of a photograph um, at different distances from the object. And then you use software to stitch um, each of those images together to create a single image. And so, for example, in that to, to photograph that one angle of that fossil, um, you would take, you know, I think from memory, we needed to do about 12 different photographs for each angle so you take and we have a computerized um, arrangement where and this is a commercial product um, not um, something we've made uh, and basically you mount your camera on a worm drive which enables you to move it forwards on an accurate plane towards the object and 
you, uh, it's accurate down to two microns. In this case, we were probably moving about three millimeters each time we took a photo. And so you traverse um, into your object and each time you move closer, a different part of the object is in focus. Um, and so the automated rig that we have after the worm drive has taken 12 photos, then it returns the camera back to the original position and it rotates the object say five degrees it's the amount of your choosing and so basically you get th therefore one turntable spin is 71 sorry 72 um, images that have, have been made up from 12 photographs that you've taken of each angle and then you repeat that process um, uh, at least a minimum of four possibly in this case I think we did seven different angles and that allows us to get very very fine very very close up details um, and the smaller your object gets then the more you need to move into the macro territory where it gets even even harder just mounting the object and as you turn the object into the table you run the risk of it going out of your shot because the camera is so close so with this fossil we took um, uh, 7 times 72 times 12 photographs and then you've got to process all of them and get the software to stitch um, all of that together. You can do use, um, there, are, there are open source free software tools for doing this work. There's one called um, Meshroom. Um, probably the most common commercial product that gets used is one called Metashape from a company called Agisoft. Uh, we're using one called Reality Capture and one of the main reasons we elected to go that route is reality capture is significantly faster than metashape and meshroom so if it you're um, effectively um, from our tests on identical hardware mesh uh, um, metashape takes maybe four times longer than reality capture and meshroom takes maybe 10 times and when you're processing this kind of data uh, it can be quite lengthy so if you can turn around a model in an hour as opposed to overnight that makes a really big difference um, i think that kind of is a good yeah. enough overview of how we go about it so it does require patience and that's where having um a, you know the better your toys are um, the better results you can get. But having said that, you can just do it with a DSLR and a tripod, um, open source software, um, and, but it does require patience. And the expression I use a bit uh, is, is that more is more in photogrammetry. So the more photographs you get, the better you'll be able to reconstruct your model. Over to you, Briani. Thank you very much, uh, obviously. Uh, Dave brings the technical knowledge to the uh, to the team. So, um, so yeah, it was really important to us that we were able to get the kind of um, like high fidelity image that that students would need to be able to study these um, fossils for academic purposes. So, so we, we've come up with a good workflow that will produce these images to the quality that we need and. Um, we've been using at the moment Sketchfab as a repository. Um, Dave, do you want to mention quickly why we cho chose Sketchfab? Um, partially because it's there. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, Sketchfab allows you to do more complex rendering of your objects. So you have to scale. Um, when we say an object this size of that coral would have, the model would have perhaps nine million polygons sketchfab has a maximum of five hundred thousand or, or about there there's a it's actually a file size i forget what it is 15 megabytes or something like that um and um, so you have to go through various processes to scale the model down to fit it onto sketchfab but one of the tricks that it has is a bunch of techniques which allow the rendering engine of sketchfab uh to um add back some of the details um, using different maps that um, hold in a graphic some of the um, topological information of the model and so it's one that just happens to be there it's easy to use um, it you can we're using just one of them uh, one of the um, academics here their personal account um, so that we can share these things and and they're all works in progress so they're not being shared 
um, uh, to the whole world. Um, but you can also, again, um, use open source tools and um, uh, WebXR and OpenGL to absolutely build exactly the same sorts of techniques that, that Sketchfab has. And there are a number of um, uh, using uh, JavaScript um, 3GS or I forget, Node.js, one of those frameworks allows you to do um, to, to build your own uh, platform for hosting models as well. But yes, yeah, so, but Sketchfab was kind of quick and easy and mm. not stupidly expensive if it's just on a personal account, but it does get a bit more expensive once you start to use um, uh, an uh, a, a institutional account. Um, and as, uh, there's a few other competitors too. There's a, a, a a movement out of Macquarie University and, uh, and they founded a platform called Pedestal 3D that's a bit more focused specifically on the research and museum angle whereas Sketchfab's uh, main uh, core business is actually selling computer models from people who are animators and model makers. Yeah. Cool. Five minutes Brian and David. Oh, thank you. Gosh, that went quick. Okay um, so you can see we can actually um link the to these models in the lms like this um so that means that we're able to um provide some of these fossils um in a practical kind of um way but it and that again as david mentioned it's actually limited this um detail is limited by what is allowed in sketchfab so we're looking for options where we can um, maintain the fidelity of the model but uh, we're not quite there so we've also it's um, pretty good though yeah, we've also pulled the models from Sketchfab into a Mozilla Hubs room that looks like a museum, similar to this one that Hugh set up for us today. Um, and Mozilla Hubs has got lots of benefits, like Hugh was talking about before, because, you know, it's device agnostic, open source, it's free for users. Um, and it really helps us to achieve our goal of students being able to study and manipulate the um, models collaboratively but straight away you can see some of the limitations when you start to kind of look at these um, things compared to you know the model that we looked at in the LMS so we, we're losing a, a lot of um, detail which makes these models less meaningful for academic purposes but um, hopefully these are things that we will be able to overcome so if you get a chance this afternoon just hop into the hub that Hugh has set up for us and play with the fossils maybe um, pick up a fossil, show it to somebody else in the room and have a chat to them about it. So that gives you the kind of um, feeling that we're going for, the kind of experience that we're going for, where it's collaborative, talking to each other and sharing um, the fossils. All right, I'm going to stop there because I would really like to take some questions or maybe uh, you might have some suggestions or comments on how you might like to use a virtual gallery in your disciplines. Thanks, thanks Bryony and David. We've got a couple of questions in the chat. So Hugh's oh. asked, Dave, are you getting a good result every time? Um, he's finding that they're struggling to get a result in reality capture, even when they try to do buildings or simple objects. Ah, uh, um, no, uh, the, we have our own our share of disasters. Um, partially, it comes back to how you've taken the photographs, and so um, one of the things that I'm trying, I'm working on at the moment, is using multiple cameras and trying to stitch those together, uh, and. Uh, partial with, with with the goal of being able to do just one turntable spin whereas previously i'd been turning the object over and shooting different sizes sides of it and then stitching it together but partially it kind of comes that down to to um which leg you stand on at the time no it doesn't really um uh, it, it's it's tricky and the more you do the better you get at it um, more photographs absolutely help but then there's issues about um, masking and hiding things that you don't want and and happy to um uh, if I, don't, I presume our emails are available if people want to email me with queries and 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 show and tell of results then i'm happy to to help but the answer is yeah no not always and sometimes you can't even make it work like the Eastern Pearson frock we did, we so wanted that to work, but and spent a lot of time putting manual control points, but it just it was not enough photographs. It just didn't work. Neroli asked, can you do sections like have a certain number of slices you can view up close? Uh, as in throw that into hubs, do you mean? Did you want to take the mic, Neroli? 
Hi, um, yeah, Narely uh, from Deakin. Um, Sorry. I mean, so, no, no, absolutely everybody does it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether when you're looking at the coral, you could have um, a slice. I want to see inside those little divots. You know, I want to put my finger in there. So if you had like a slice that you could take and you could look up, look at the edges very closely, um, it might even be just a, a click point and you pull up a, a still image. I don't know. It just occurred to me. I wondered if you were doing that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know, Mozilla Hubs. In theory, you can do anything, uh, whether or not you can do it in Mozilla Hubs. So the, the answer of pop up other assets like 2D or small sections. In terms of actually slicing through the object, you've got to use like CT scan technology to be able to do that, um, uh, which is not what we're working on. Um, and um, as uh, we did a research project where we, we spoke to most of the major collecting institutions around Australia just to see where they were up to. And a lot of the biological sciences, science collecting institutions were fairly advanced in their use of 3D imagery because they'd been partnering with hospitals or whatever to get access to CT scanners. Uh, and as well um, uh, at ANU, they're building their own micro CT scanners, which give you much more resolution um, than you get with a hospital scanner. Um, and uh, obviously a lot more radiation, so you don't stick your hand in one of those. Um, uh, but yeah, so the answer is yes, using CT scanning, you can slice through an object and take a picture of the, and that's kind of how they work. Um, but th then you would need to have um, pop-up graphics and scenes and more details and things like that is obviously something that we're looking at. Um, yeah. But whether or not you can do it in hubs, I don't know. No, no not hubs. I imagine you can't, but thanks. Yeah. That's good tough. Yeah. No worries. And Hugh's got his hand up. Hugh, did you want to ask your question? Um, I was just going to actually um, just chime in on the, the hubs part uh, of Nerali's question and say that if you had um, a coral sliced, uh, you know, into 10 different pieces that you could put those 10 different pieces in as 10 different models, um, or if you wanted them to, uh, and then let students kind of pick them up. <clears throat> Or you could um, uh, actually have them animated to be, you know, one piece of coral, and then maybe it concertinas apart so that you can see the slices, because hubs and 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 I'm speaking hubs because uh, I think all platforms will be doing this in the future is it respects the animation that was created in the 3D model, which is very nice. If you go to Ben's room, you'll see he's got a beating human heart that they created there. Oh, cool. uh, and you can pick it up and it'll beat in your hand, which is you can reenact Indiana Jones. <laughs> Thanks. OK, does anyone else have any questions? You can either take the mic or you can type them into the chat. OK, all good. Now these guys will be hanging around as well for a little bit. I think you're at the expo this afternoon. Yeah, you've got a space in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you can still keep asking questions through the channel and they'll be here to answer those as well. So thank you, Bryony and David. That was yeah. awesome. A pleasure. Thank you. Okay.